Welcome to JW Broadcasting for December 2023. What Watchtower leaders think Jehovah's Witnesses do when they hear this announcement? <laughs> Versus what Jehovah's Witnesses actually do when they hear this announcement. Hello and welcome back to the JW Thoughts channel. My name is Wally and today we are looking at the December JW Broadcasting episode. Don't forget to drop a like on this video. It helps it get out to more people on YouTube and subscribe to the channel if you want to see further content like this going f f forward in the future. With all of that being said, let's do this. Now, unlike the chairman of the midweek meeting, I'm not going to be able to give you an overview of the information we're going to hear this morning. Why are you the way that you are? But I can tell you one thing. I've looked over the themes that the instructors and other responsible brothers have turned in, and they're mighty interesting. There's something wonderful about going from sitting in the audience, laughing at these guys' bad jokes, to sitting in the audience and laughing at these guys and their bad jokes. Well, you know how Nehemiah felt. You've seen Jehovah answer prayers in your life. Continue to rely on prayer, even more so now as you take on new assignments, encounter new situations. And yes, when you have strong feelings on a matter, remember the builder, get his direction. Now, I don't think I actually mentioned it at the outset of this video, but we are looking at the Gilead graduation. And as we have learned from the past, sometimes they can get a little bit dry, so we won't be breaking down every single little thing, but maybe just a little interesting tidbits. Now, this particular section was talking about the need for prayer, uh, using the illustration of being a master builder. And who's the master builder? Well, of course, it's Jehovah, so you need to consult the master builder in order to get the best results. So uh, this is something that I struggled with as a witness because I could never really find the, the results when it came to praying. I, even as a fully believing Jehovah's Witness, I struggled to see it as, oh, well, I prayed about this thing and then there was an answer to my prayer. Like answers to prayers were so rare it just never really made sense. And one of the more interesting things that I've done in the past, and this is something I've talked about in a previous video, but I really struggled with fear of demons and Satan, and they were all around me, and I, I was terrified all of the time. And so what I did to try and counteract that, or the only thing that I could think to do was, well, what if I actually invited Satan, because Watchtower is always using, well, we don't want to invite the devil into your life. Well, what if I quite literally did it? And what if I prayed to Satan every single day for a month to see if anything happened and nothing at all happened? So then you, 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 you pray to Jehovah and nothing happens. You pray to Satan and nothing happens. So it was a way for me to counteract that fear that I was just, it was crippling. I mean, just being in a dark room and seeing a light or hearing a noise, I just was always terrified of being infected with the demon. So uh, that's something that I did just to balance it out in my own head and was like, well, maybe it's not as serious as Watchtower is always putting it. One final thought regarding our master builder. Jehovah is a happy God. Imperfection in Satan's system caused suffering. That's true. But remember that serving Jehovah brings joy despite those challenges. And there is strength in that joy. Sounds like the joyful noise before our meetings and assemblies or even here this morning before your graduation program. But did you notice? It was Jehovah who made them rejoice. Despite the challenges now and those to come, 
Strengthen others by remembering to enjoy Jehovah's service. Now, this is something that's always curious to me because when I was a Jehovah's Witness, I always thought, oh, I'm receiving all of this joy and happiness because I am a Jehovah's Witness. And then after leaving, I sort of realized that all of that was predicated not on being a Jehovah's Witness, but it was on being with my friends, being with my family. That is the only things that I really enjoyed. It, would anyone out there, I've never talked to any Jehovah's Witnesses that enjoyed the preaching work, if you remove being able to preach with other people. If you had to do it by yourself, I don't know if there's anyone that, oh, no, I just really enjoyed the preaching work. Going to meetings, going to conventions, the biggest thing I looked forward to, and you did too, going to a convention or an assembly, was hanging out and seeing your friends, catching up with people you haven't seen for a long time. And any time I had to do something solo, like doing the auditing of the finances, trying to make new territories, um, doing like the bookkeeping and tr trying to like s organize the literature, all of that, whenever it was by myself, I was miserable. It was an awful experience. So when he's talking about you getting joy from, you know, being a Jehovah's Witness, essentially, from doing Jehovah's Witness things, it, he's not really giving them the truth. The truth and the reality of the situation is, yes, you can find joy, but it's going to require good people around you. And if you have awful people around you, or if you're by yourself, you are going to be completely miserable. And that is really the lie that Jehovah's Witnesses are constantly fed. That narrative of, oh, we're the happiest people ever. No, you're not. You just extract some happy moments that you don't attribute, oh, I just had a good time with my friends. You attribute it to, oh, I was doing something for Jehovah, and that's what made me happy. But that is like cult indoctrination 101. You take anything good and you try and fool someone into thinking that the cause of that good feeling, you, you get that dopamine rush, is coming from a place that it just isn't. And that's about all that I have to say about this talk. So, uh, yeah, as a Jehovah's Witness, I kind of thought Book of Nehemiah, kind of mid, pretty boring. After this talk, Book of Nehemiah, kind of mid, pretty boring. So let's move right along. I don't know about you, but it makes me want to read the Book of Nehemiah all over again. <laughs> what? Bro, what are you talking about, man? Well, now we're going to hear from another recently appointed helper to the service committee, Brother Betty Georges, and he's going to talk to us on the subject, The Steps of Love. Poor kids are just as bright and just as talented as white kids. And I ate Jenny's ice cream, chocolate chip. America is a nation that can be defined in a single word. I was going to put him in uh, foot, foot, excuse me. What are the steps of love? There are three. Step one, love of God. Step two, love of neighbor. And step three, love of self. And of course, we're not talking about the selfish, self-centered attitude that people have today. We all need a measure of self-worth, self-respect. If we were to take a picture of these steps, they would look something like this. Makes sense that the highest step and the first love of God. Well, boy, howdy. This is a real situation. I get really annoyed when Watchtower tries to play this little game. So first off, what does love of God mean if you are a Jehovah's Witness? Well, which God are we talking about? Well, the Christian God of the Bible. Well, which Bible are we going to use? The Jehovah's Witness Bible. What interpretation of that Bible are we going to use? The Jehovah's Witness interpretation of it. Can I think for myself about what I read in those interpretations or in that Bible? No, you can't. 
So we're not talking about love for God, we're talking about love for Watchtower. Cool. Love of neighbor. Oh, I want to go and help my elderly neighbor do some groceries or work around the house or go work at a soup kitchen or help homeless people. No, that's not what love of neighbor means because you have to ask Watchtower what that really means. And they say, you need to go and knock on doors at 9 a.m. You need to go stand next to a witnessing cart at 5 p.m. You need to go to your meetings. You need to watch our little videos. So love of neighbor is just doing free things for Watchtower. So the biggest priorities in your life on this little stair of love is love of Watchtower and doing free stuff for Watchtower. This is something that I've lived and know all too well. You put yourself below some organization that's telling you what to do. This is not love that they're describing. What they're describing in this little fake love staircase here is control because they want you to prioritize work and loyalty to Watchtower above yourself. What's the lesson for us? We want to be quick to give, yes, commendation, but also motivation. When Watchtower said this, it said, Watchtower said, at this point, end our ways for life. Our brothers, they don't need critics. There's enough critics in the world, but they need friends to help them reach the finish line. What's that smell? No, I don't think it's those onions that randomly appeared on my desk. I think it's a bunch of nonsense coming out from Watchtower. You cannot sit there and be the most critical organization in the, in the world, maybe not in the world, but that I know of, and yet say, oh, oh, the world is full of so many critics. We don't need any more critics. What are you talking about? If you are a Jehovah's Witness, every single thing you do, every action you take is not only criticized by Watchtower, it's criticized by other Jehovah's Witnesses, and this is a really fun little cult tactic, you are critical of yourself. It, it is so out of control about just how critical you are of every single little move you make. You want to watch a movie. You want to listen to music. You want to read a book. You want to pick up a magazine. You want to go on vacation. You want to do something on a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a weekend. You, uh, you do what Watchtower wants you to do. And then they like going out in the ministry. And then people are critical of how you even go out trying to preach. Oh, well, the circuit overseer has this suggestion. Oh, an elder has this suggestion. Oh, a pioneer has this suggestion. Oh, the Watchtower has this suggestion. Every single little thing you do is monitored and criticized when you are a Jehovah's Witness. They know no boundaries whatsoever, and individuals cannot set boundaries and say, no, back off, bucko. I, 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 no, you need to chill. That is not an option when you are a Jehovah's Witness. So it absolutely smells whenever they say, oh, man, there's so many critics out there in the world. Oh, oh. We don't need any more critics, do we? Am I, am I right? Yeah, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you definitely don't need any more critics. In fact, you need less critics. And if you want to find out that what that life looks like, just leave. And not a lot happened throughout the rest of this talk. It was pretty much just this little staircase thing, and things went exactly as you'd expect. So let's move right along to someone that is eerily close. I feel like they could pass for Gage Flegel's dad. Obviously it's not, but now that I thought it, I can't get it out of my head. Are you my dad? Jehovah remembers that we are dust. What does it mean, and why should we never forget it? Well, first, what does this expression mean, Jehovah remembers that we're dust? Simply put this, Jehovah is mindful of our sinful nature and inclined to forgive repentant sinners. Uh, notice how the context indicates this. If you look up at verses 1 and 2, uh, David begins the psalm by exhorting himself never to forget 
what Jehovah has done. And what has Jehovah done? Verse 3, first, David mentions, Jehovah forgives. And in the verses that follow, David four times refers to mercy, the tender quality that moves Jehovah to forgive. And he four times refers to loyal love, the love that moves Jehovah to treat us as his special property. Forgiveness, mercy, loyal love, they're connected. How so? Because you won't get any of that if you are a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, wow, this guy said a lot uh, in such a short amount of time. So let's just work our way through it here. Uh, first off, weird that he describes being a Jehovah's Witness as, oh, you are special property. You are God's special property. But we all know that God is just a euphemism for the governing body. So that's kind of a weird term. If you look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, do you want to be the property of the governing body? And whatever that answer is, you might want to uh, run with, uh, with that. Anyway, uh, the other aspect of this is something that I know I've talked about it maybe before, but it's creating the problem and then giving the solution. And it's just annoying just hearing that. Uh, you are sinful. You're, you are the born this evil little baby enemy of God. And then offering the magic pill. It's a really... Um, Um, insidious way that cults, religious leaders throughout ages, ones that had bad motives especially, uh, try and get people hooked on their product, their, their version of whatever religion that they're trying to spout. And Watchtower is absolutely no different. They try and push this narrative to make you feel like you are nothing, you can be nothing, Unless you have God's mercy and God's good grace. Hey, where do you get God's mercy and God's good grace? <laughs> well, it just happens to be right here at Watchtower HQ. So it's a very predatory thing that they do. And it's not uncommon to find this outside of religious circles as well. You can do this as in the exact same way as if you're in a bad relationship where, you know, someone's telling you that what's wrong with you and then, oh, but it's okay. I still love you. It's a really unhealthy way to live your life in general. But uh, yeah, just a couple of points about the overall theme of this talk. And uh, we'll probably just move right along to the next one, but we'll see if he has anything else interesting to say. Verse 12 reads, as far off as the sunrise or east is from the sunset or west, so far off he has put our transgressions. How far is east from west? The Close to Jehovah book explains it this way. In a sense, east is always at the utmost distance imaginable from west. The two points can never meet. So a lot of times I'll make a video and someone in the comments will say, yo, I can't even watch this. You just cut away too much. I want to hear the whole talk. Well, for anyone that uh, is wanting to hear the whole talk, this is what you have before you. I I'm trying to do you a favor here because there ain't much going on. Dude spends 35 seconds talking about, ooh, Let's get a reference work to describe it's as far as the sunset to the sunrise. Like, the point of an illustration is that it's comprehensible, it's easy to understand. And yet, he not only has to explain that, but then he also tries to bring in this reference work. Well, the God's Love Book said this about this. It's like, point being, when I'm cutting these talks up, I promise you, you ain't missing much. She reminds us of you, dear sisters. Much of what you achieve may not be as noticeable as your husband's achievements. And that could just be the nature of the assignment. What did he say? She reminds us of you, dear sisters. Much of what you achieve may not be as noticeable as your husband's achievements. And that could just be the nature of the assignment. Which means you may get less attention 
but you take pleasure in that Jehovah knows all that you do for him, and we love you for that. So you brothers, many things you do will be noticed. There may be some things where you won't get recognition, perhaps for a long time. And by the way, it's not wrong to get recognition. I'm not going to go in depth on this talk uh, just because it's really triggering hearing him uh, and how he talks to the, the audience here because he continues to say, well, you know this and you feel this way and this is what you already know. And it's really condescending and irritating and slightly triggering because when you're a Jehovah's Witness, you're always told what you feel and what you think and what you are and you're never able to come up with those things on your own. But boy, howdy. Does this guy just have zero recognition about the words coming out of his mouth? So this whole thing, the whole basis or premise of the talk is talking about Jehovah knows what you do. Even if you don't get recognition, it's fine because sometimes you just have to be content. So he gives us whole spiel in the story about priest Jehoiada and blah, 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 a bunch of boring nonsense. Anyway, so we get to this point and he says, hey, you ladies out there. Most of the things you do will be completely unrecognized. Hey, my fellas out there, most of the things you do will get recognized. What what a head scratcher that he can just say those two things. Sorry, he doesn't say most, he says many, but it's funny because it's for a for a sister, a woman, basically nothing you do will ever get recognized because what would you get recognized for? That would have been funny if he would have actually tried to come up with an example. And yet for the men, it's, oh, only some of the things you do are going to go unrecognized. And, oh, man, it's so hard. But how can we manage to deal with it? It's just so grim being a sister, especially in this Gilead situation where you have given your entire life to the organization, you've basically reached the absolute peak, and you've done everything, everything that the man sitting next to you, your husband, has done as well. You've put in the hours, you've done the the meetings, you've done the commenting, you've done the service, you you brought the old lady groceries, all of those, all of those things you've done. And now you're just told, hey, remember, basically you will get recognition for absolutely nothing other than, you know, you'll get some secondhand recognition from what your husband gets. But you, men on the other hand, most of the things you do will be recognized and only a few won't. It's just a really fascinating juxtaposition. And uh, I, I don't know if he's just a bozo for saying that, but I know if I was a woman sitting in the audience here, I'd be like... What did you just say to me? Come come down and say that to my face. We don't know her name, but we know her husband. I swear, every time I make fun of Watchtower for something, they somehow manage to make it worse, and I don't even know that they're about to make it worse. Oh, these guys suck. He was a hard-working fisherman, outspoken apostle, writer of two Bible books, and the only person besides Jesus to walk on water. Yeah, we know Peter. But sometimes we forget his wife. What was Peter's wife like? What were they like as a married couple? And what can they teach you, 24 married couples? This is the first time in close to a decade we've had an entire class of only married couples. Thus, we've chosen Peter and his wife so that you can learn specific lessons that you can bring with, to your places of assignment, but especially to strengthen your marriages as you apply this and you serve together side by side. Let's begin by reading Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 16. While walking alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, that's Jesus, saw Simon and Simon's brother Andrew casting their nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. Peter's a fisherman. He brings home the fish. His wife cooks the fish. And if she doesn't cook the fish, she sells the fish. Like a capable Proverbs 31 wife brings home the money. 
God helps support the house. It allows Peter to handle his responsibilities. All is well. A great couple working side by side together. However, now comment down below if you remember that Peter had a wife at all. Because I don't know how, but it must have slipped my mind. So I'll raise my hand. I'm guilty. So Jesus said to them, Come after me and I will make you fishers of men. And at once they abandoned their nets and followed him. In faith, Peter abandons his fishing business and follows Jesus. What did she think about that? Did she expect that? Did she become insecure and uncertain now about the future? Did, would she feel that her life now has been upended by the decisions of her impulsive, big-hearted husband? Peter, what are you doing? <laughs> we have very good reason to conclude that Peter's wife supported the decision and willing to and ready to stand right at Peter's side as he took on added responsibilities. Somehow in 2023, Watchtower has managed to maintain its absolutely archaic view of the world. Yes, Peter's wife was a good woman. She was at home cooking the fish that he was catching, taking care of the kids and cleaning house. Yeehaw, what a great time to be alive. This talk is incredibly stupid. I, I'm, I'm done with it. Peter's wife is never even directly mentioned in the Bible a single time. It's just his mother-in-law. So all of this is just like a D&D &D campaign, and we're just watching some goofballs from Watchtower HQ role-playing out a funny little campaign. And honestly, I can think of about a million things I'd rather do, and you should also want to do with your time then listen to this crap. So we're going to stop it right there. That was the last talk uh, as far as this JW broadcasting goes. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of whatever this was. But don't forget to stay safe, be kind, and don't forget to smile. And I know you're going to have a good ass day.